It's taking more than 55. You are live. Oh, I am live. Hey. What's up? Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, welcome to the annual HIPAA tri Privacy Security and Breach Educational Training Session. My name is Chris, and I'll be your presenter for today. Uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to join us. And I do have a studio audience here, so we'll try just to ignore them as we move forward. Um, anyway, so thank you for joining us. And um, certainly remember, there will be poll questions we'll ask you to participate with. The handout will be available uh, for you to download. <clears throat> and uh, there will be um, the slides will be presented as we go along here. So let's start with the beginning. And the beginning is always to talk about the goals of the program. And just like before, the goals for all of us is to appreciate once again that our patients are depending upon us to protect their privacy, as we would expect for ourselves. We also need to appreciate that diligence in, in our data protection is just good business. We should we need to take care of the data that, that we uh, garner from our patients and, and the privacy that they expect. It also, of course, it follows the federal and state laws. And then lastly, appreciate that in our roles uh, in our company, in your division, in your practice, that these, these are very important for the sake of our employment. <clears throat> but Chris, really, why, 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 why do you have to tell us about this again? And why are we here? Again, it's, it's because for no other reason, you have to appreciate that healthcare remains one of the top places of attack for cyber criminals. Um, this is the, what you're in the upper left-hand corner in the arrow is the average number of weekly attacks for a given organization. You can see how many attacks are occurring um, in, in healthcare. Uh, and the cost, the cost associated with cybercrime is huge. It's in the billions of dollars. Um, and that's another reason why we need to pay attention. Um, in MHA's case, uh, for the first 16 days of, 2000 and, of December 2022, you can see the number of attacks we had in our own data. Um, they, they, we get these constant what's called intrusions on our firewall of these, of these folks trying to get into our system, and it happens every single day. Um, but really, why also is because of the expense associated. Uh, when it, if you have HIPAA violations, they come with penalties. And depending on the, uh, the extent of the, of the issue, uh, those penalties can get very, very expensive into the millions of dollars. <clears throat> in our case, in MHA's case, <clears throat> excuse me, we're actually on the tail end of an active investigation that was caused by one complaint. One complaint led to what you're seeing uh, in front of you there, uh, and that complaint was about whether or not we released all the information that was requested uh, and on a rel relatively simple chart chart review uh, or chart uh, uh, request. And as a result of that, the patient's mom took issue with what was not included and decided um, that her course of action was to file a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights. So once that happens, the legal process starts churning, it cost starts occurring, and the time it takes to work with the government um, uh, it, it is expensive uh, across the board. And so the outcome of this particular case, we feel very confident that we'll be fine, but there's gonna be some learning in here. It's gonna cause us to go back and look to make sure that our policies and procedures at all the divisions in the MHA are following the right rules um, and guidelines to, uh, for, the, the, for the information we release when we get a bona fide record release. So let's go back to the beginning when HIPAA's, HIPAA was first created. Um, it, the, really, there are three pieces to HIPAA that we need to keep in mind. The transaction sets is really the behind the scenes work that was done well before HIPAA became known to us. That really was talking about the relationship between the disparate databases that are out there and how data would be transferred from one entity to another. Where, where HIPAA really started meaning something for us in medical practices was when in privacy, the privacy laws came out in 2003, followed by the high tech. High tech was basically privacy expanded. It also introduced other features that weren't included in the initial privacy. And it also talked about the arrival of uh, EPHI. Security breach came, came by afterwards and security breach talked once again about EPHI and breach of course was the, uh, the disclosure of information inappropriately or incorrectly. So HIPAA is all about PHI. And the thing to keep in mind with PHI is that really there's two components to PHI. There's the health information, the data point, and then the fact that it can be individually attached to an individual. 
So if I were to say a glucose of 212, for example, well, that's just a piece of health information. It's really meaningless until I say, oh, no, that 212 glucose belongs to Chris Terabasi. Once that has happened, then you have bona fide PHI. Um, the privacy law, as I mentioned, was in 2003. High tech, which included the breach, was 2019. Uh, they enhanced it or made it worse, depending on your perspective, in 2013. And then New York State got into the game a couple of years ago and decided to implement the SHIELD Act, which took the HIPAA laws and expanded them across PHI into all privacy areas. So now the our protection goes beyond protecting PHI. We're obliged in New York State to protect the privacy of our patients as well. Uh, the basic of tenant, the basic tenant of HIPAA, and this is the starting point of what HIP, where HIPAA starts, is that we cannot, even medical health associates and all the divisions cannot use or disclose PHI, period, unless it's permitted by the law. So it starts with an absolute restriction about re, uh, using PHI, using or disclosing it, unless it's permitted. And the government has given us three types of permit, permitted disclosures. And the acronym for that is TOP, Treatment, Operations, and Payment. If we're using PHI for the purposes of rendering treatment, so that's the doctor uh, talking to the patient, for example, and, and writing notes, he's using that or she's using that for treatment purposes. If nurse is talking to doctor, doctor's talking to front desk, and front desk is talking to patient, all part of the operations of our company, if you will, of our practice, that is also a permitted use. And lastly, when it comes to payment, when we talk to health tech, for example, about payment, when Lisa from the billing office calls, your, calls the nurse and says, I need the information about this patient, that's all the payment side. And so for those three reasons, if what we're doing is using or disclosing, it's permitted under the law without an express written permission by the patient to do it. If it's not one of those three, then we are obliged by law to get permission from the patient for disclosure. Or when we're compelled for some legal purpose most often to release the information. If we get a summons, for example, that's a legal document that says we have to release. That is a permitted use only because we're compelled by the law. So in our, in our policy manual, we have this thing called the Notice of Privacy Practices. We were obliged to create this document back in 2003 and publish it and have the patient sign off on it when they, when they uh, join our practice, that they know that that document exists and they have access to it. We last updated it in August of 2022, just made some more type, just changes, uh, not nothing really substantial to the document, but it does exist. Um, patients sign off on this document and you all have access to this electronically, knowingly or unknowingly, we do. And if a patient, of course, requests it, we're obliged to give them our actual hard copy or email copy of the document. So uh, we have our official HIPAA manual. Here's, here's a copy. Each division will begin to copy this manual. Uh, you're looking at the cover, the cover page on the, on the slide. Um, this, was, this is renewed or reviewed each year. Uh, shared with the compliance committee, and it's the uh, this is the hundred and some odd page document has all the policies and procedures with regards to privacy, security, and breach. And you'll be again, you'll be getting a copy of this in your division, so feel free to grab it from your manager when when he or she gets it. Okay, let's talk about the minimum necessary requirement. One of the things, one of the covenants of the, of the HIPAA world is that we all appreciate what minimum necessary requirement is. And by definition, what that is, is that we're only releasing the PHI needed to access the specific task we're undergoing. So really it's asking us to focus our use of PHI, either we're using it or disclosing it based on what we're trying to accomplish and not going beyond that. That's, that's what we're expected to do when it comes to using or disclosing PHI. Um, something that's new for this go around is something referred to as the designated record set. The designated record set is the, are, is the information within the chart that fits into a certain categories that would be eligible to be reproduced in the event of a record release request. Now, this really came into play, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the investigation we're finishing up um, when we were challenged as to what is included in our, our designated record set. 
And I think out of this process we're going through, through the investigation, we're going to seize an opportunity to educate ourselves to be sure that every office is on the same page about what is included in Medical Health Associates' designated record set. In fact, next week I'll be working with the Compliance Committee to look at our current designated record set to see if it should be enhanced or changed. Um, and then once that is determined, we will share that information across all the divisions to be sure everybody's on the same page. If you're interested and you look at the book, it's on page 15. I do encourage everyone to really look at what it says in the document. Okay, another thing, there's another covenant. It's called incident exposure. The law does not expect us to be able to protect data in all circumstances. There's all kinds of risks out there that would cause us to not be able to protect the data like we would want to. But we are expected to provide basic safeguards um, with how we work with our data. So for example, you know, where's our recycle bin? Are we throwing papers in there that have PHI on them that could potentially be picked up by by a patient? Are we using the shredding bin appropriately? Are we, uh, is our computer always on so patients can see in other patients' information? Um, do we discuss patients in the hallway? Can you hear through the walls? Very simple things, apparently, that we need to be aware of to be sure we're doing what we can uh, to protect to protect that, inf that vital information. Any questions so far, studio audience? No, everybody's so happy. <laughs> Makes me happy. Okay, so let's keep going. So why is there a security rule? Well, security rule is all about EPHI. EPHI is the release and disclosure, same as PHI, but using electronic means, email, fax, computers, and so on. Um, it's really all about taking that data point and electrifying it in some way and transmitting it. We are expected to protect EPHI to the extent, in some cases, better extent than we would PHI or paper PHI, if you will. Okay, security risk assessment. Each year, we are obliged to undergo an internal assessment of our um, security risks. And in that regard, I work very closely with uh, our vendor at technology to look at uh, every electronic device, every staff person, the role that they have in the company, their level of access. We have to look at outside agents who have access to our data. For example, health tech is probably the number one, uh, night nurse, uh, the Abbott answering service, all these outside agents who have access to our data, whether it's electronic or not. Just make sure that they, uh, we have business associated agreements in place that, that holds them responsible, like it holds us responsible for protecting data. We have to consider any system activity, MedMB being number one, that has access to uh, PHI, and we need to make sure that, uh, that it's protected. And ultimately, we have to identify any what is known as vulnerabilities in our systems and, and work to prevent or mitigate vulnerabilities. Once again, we can't it's impossible to identify every single vulnerability that we have. Some, some of them arise because of reasons that are unknown to us. Um, but and when we do identify them, we need to think about a way or come up with a way to mitigate that vulnerability or hopefully eliminate it. So teeth, we're obliged to have teeth in our policies and procedures. That's the government expects us to be able to demonstrate if we have a breach or we have a HIPAA violation within our company that we have dealt with it. And the dealing with it most often, hopefully, is a retraining program. Hey, you can't send an email that's with PHI that's encrypted kind of thing, and this is why, is a retraining versus a, a, a purposeful breach of, of trust and, and data uh, that would requal, requires uh, warnings and suspensions and ultimately termination. So, um, our policy certainly has a, uh, a set of teeth that we need that meets the criteria. Is this our first poll? I think so. So our first poll is um, start. No, nope, that's not it. Why is it? Is it okay? It's just, it's just oh, it's just a question. So I should close yeah. this. Just leave. Is it okay? Okay. Cool. Dawn Spritz over here. She's wonderful. <laughs> COVID testing vaccination information. Is that considered uh, is that considered HIPAA? Well, true. It is. Of course. It's a piece of health information. 
and it can be attached to an individual so that we'd be covered under the HIPAA law. And if you're interested, there is a link here to the government uh, that would also enforce that. Reports and audits. Um, again, we have to look at each system and determine the extent to which we can generate audit and tracker reports. We have to be able to trace back or reverse engineer a breach to the cause. We're expected to be able to identify where the breach occurred and who was involved in that breach. So, for example, uh, this may be difficult to see, but we're able to uh, look at our activity tracking log. So, for example, Deb Blanchard is someone that uh, Medical Health Associates worked with. Maybe some of you know her. She's a consultant who has access uh, to our PHI. Uh, she helps with NCQA. She helps with meaningful use uh, reporting. And so we're able to look at her user level and see how many hours that she is on top or using the MedN system. This next one is a user login status. We actually log, we don't, MedEnt does, logs every single access into the MedEnt system, whether it failed or not, or if the person actually had gained access to the MedEnt. And lastly, we can look to see by user who is accessing what files. And in this case, our friend Tanya has been accessing these patient ID numbers. It tells you the reason. Uh, why she was asking or what areas that she accessed it. So again, we have the ability to look into the chart, uh, into a patient's chart to see who accessed that file. So the bottom line uh, when it comes to this, uh, this access, you should only access the charts for which your purpose is related to the care of the patient in your office. Um, especially keep this in mind before you access yourself in the hospital portals. We have had situations where people would look onto a hospital portal to look up their own medical records. Um, it's not necessarily a HIPAA violation for medical health associates, but it certainly is one for the hospital that was, uh, that was tapped. Um, you have to be careful. You shouldn't look up your family members. You shouldn't look up your workmates. You shouldn't look up your friends. You shouldn't touch celebrities. So, you know, either curiosity, caring, or snooping. It's one of those three reasons can get you into trouble once it's caught. Questions, comments? Wake up. Okay. <laughs> Kidding. They're all into it. Okay, good. Quick yeah, quiz. Is this it? Oh. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So here's your first quiz. Let those answers pile in. Who is the HIPAA security officer? Is it the managing partner in your group? Is it the rock? Is it yours truly? Is it all of the above? Look at those answers pouring in. Wow. Well, thank you for that. And the answer, of course, is yours truly. Um, and of course, I say that just because, um, I don't know, I, I like to be noticed. I don't know why. So security officer. So the security officer is charged with a very important role. And that really is to review and update the policies, to communicate those policies, to insist upon the training that you need to go through each year, yes, each year, to be sure we're refreshed that these are living policies that we need to pay attention to. And to hold you accountable, hold, hold all of us accountable, hold the, account, the company accountable in the event we have a problem. And then again, preparing and re-looking re, re at them in, in, another, in another year as needed. So one of the things that we need to do ourselves is to protect ourselves against malicious software. Now, malicious software is all about software that's been written by people who want to do us harm. And so it's very important that we, that we not download software programs, even if you think it's okay to do it and you've been told it's okay to do it by someone, uh, a consultant or an advisor, um, it's very important that you do not download software onto your desktop, onto the computer without first going through ad technology or yours truly directly to be sure there's no other issues. Um, you should never open email attachments associated to a personal email that's sent to you zip files and these jokes and video clips people send from time to time are one of the biggest reasons why malware gets downloaded onto a computer. Um, when you open emails, be sure you even if even if it's someone you're expecting to get it from, take a look at the sender address next to the name because the sender address will be a first clue that that email is is damaged or it's going to damage you. If you see anything suspicious, if the hair on your neck stands up, if you're just not sure, always better to ask. Send me an email. Happy to get them. 
I get them at least once a week from one, from some of you, and I appreciate them. I appreciate that you're willing to take a look, take that second to just be sure that it's it's a valid email. And sometimes I'm even fooled, and I need to get help myself. So um, we're in this together. So mechanisms used by attackers, as I mentioned, malware um, is downloaded to target computers, to really go after the system as a whole, um, and to violate our encryption. This is your ransomware. And then phishing emails. These are the emails that come from very nefarious or creative, depending how you look at them, uh, individuals who are trying to solicit information from you for the purposes of, of well, basically vic victimizing you or the company to do something we shouldn't be doing. So yours truly um, uh, participates in this PII program. And um, some of you do. Unfortunately, most of you have not taken advantage of this training. Um, this training came about by virtue of the upgrade we did to our email system last year. If you're one of those folks that that is doing the programming, the training program, I thank you. Um, we have not made it mandatory yet, but uh, we do encourage you to do it. Why? Because it not only protects you here at work, it protects you at home. There's a lot of good information that I bet you don't know about that will help you protect your own personal data as well as the company's data. Um, you're looking at my score some time ago. I think I did it. This was in December of 643 out of 800. I have looked at the scores and some of you are at 799. So congratulations, you're at the peak. So that means you're just keeping up with your training. Good for you. Uh, for those who don't even know what I'm talking about, that's okay too. What I'd like you to do is send me an email after the session and, and I'll let you know how easy it is to do this to, to do this training. And rather than that first thing in the morning when you feel compelled to, to visit, maybe take five minutes and do a training um, and just get it out of the way. It's simple. It's a quick quiz, but it enhances your score and it educates you on protecting yourself. Okay, so that leads to the infamous, as I call it, October 28th, 2022 experience. Maybe you remember it, maybe you don't. But in this, in this uh, corner right here, it was an email that came ostensibly from LinkedIn. Well, to, this is through our PEI program because every quarter or so, it sends out a fake phishing email with the hopes of providing an opportunity to educate us on what we should be looking for. In the case of this email, it went out to 218 uh, emails, MHA emails. 36 people opened the email. So that means I, my math is not that great, but a lot more did not. Some of those people probably have never opened it, or maybe they don't even check their email. I don't know. <laughs> but of the 36 that did open it, nine people ex actually uh, touched the link. Guess who was one of the folks that touched the link? My score, the 643, went down to 490. And... It just I just use it as an example. No matter how good you are, at, you think you are at catching these emails. I remember vividly when this happened. I had taken a day off. I came back in. I was in a hurry. I do LinkedIn from time to time. I said, oh, LinkedIn, who, what's going on? I touched it, and I got the same email I would see if it was a ransom email. And they're scary-looking emails. Trust me. Um, so... Uh, it, it, we're going to continue to test, folks. I do encourage you that you don't get victimized like I did uh, because education is the key to helping us through this. Okay, moving on. Each year I send you, I, I, I capture these emails uh, that, uh, and these are, they're difficult to read. Uh, I capture the emails that are interesting in the past year. And so I'll, I'll share them with you because I think it's something you can look for. So, for example, in the first one, what I'm trying to highlight is that the sender name does not match the person who was sending. In this case, it looked like it was coming from Mainpeds, but if you look at the sender, you can see it's not Mainpeds sender. In this next one, um, what was interesting about this one is it, these emails will tend to try to frighten you. Oh my God, your MNT account has been deleted or disabled. Well, I have MNT myself. The company has business with MNT. Holy smokes! What did Gina do now? Why? Are, why do? I, why is our MNT disabled? Well, sure enough, if you looked up above, and this made it even more scary. If you look at the domain name, it says at mhawy.com. So this is supported MHA telling us our MNT account has been disabled. Oh my gosh! What do I do? What do I do? Well, I go call Gina and say, Gina, what'd you do? And she said, I didn't touch it. 
And next thing you know, I shared it with m &T, but this was this these people can be creative and they create sender names that closely mimic your own name. So um, again, just another example of how good these people can be. And this one, um, never, never always pay attention to those that have some sense of urgency. In this case, do not ignore this request. Well, of course, I ignored it, but the point, but not long enough, or long enough to make a copy of it because again, there always be a sense of urgency in these fake emails. Lastly, this one was from Walmart. And Walmart, well, not last year, this one's from Walmart. And this is an example of these, these folks that will grab a logo off of the internet and plop it into an email to make it look legitimate. And this one was Walmart. We've seen them for banks. We've seen them for IT companies. We've seen them um, all over the place. So be aware that just because there's a logo there doesn't necessarily mean it's legitimate. And this, this oh, this here's our Deb Blanchard. She's back. Uh, Deb Blanchard is someone we work with. The email she sent it from is legitimate. This is someone she, it's possible that Deb Blanchard would send us a file. And this is the link that she would have expected us to touch to launch this file. I got this email and it still did not seem right to me. So I ended up calling Deb Blanchard and sure enough, her email at her office, the strategic interest had been hacked. Mm -hmm. So someone got a hold of her contact information and just sent out these emails to people. So. Again, it, it, this was a tough one. This is one of those tough ones I had to get help on. Um, but sure enough, it was a fake email as well. And the last one was kind of, I sort of had fun with this one. So it turns out uh, Dr. Zumagala, who's a doctor at Western New York Pediatrics, um, emailed Lauren Campisi, who was a former office manager at Tano on the Peds, to ask her to update her direct deposit information. So fortunately, this was caught very easily. Um, and sent, and of course it's spam and we figured it out very quickly. Years ago, I won't say three years ago, we got burned on this very email. Um, our HR department didn't catch it. And it was obviously, it looked very legitimate. And so they did what they had to do and we got it fixed, but nonetheless it caught us. Um, but I decided to have a little fun with this one. So I took the email address that was there and I emailed the person. So I emailed and I said, oh, Jess, I'm here to help you. Um, what do I need to do? And the person responded um, with their banking information. So the person who was trying to screw us um, sent us the account number and the rounding number and the name of the bank. And then, of course, this I did this on my on my work Gmail account, which I don't use very often. And uh, the person, Jessica Hollander, who happens to be a nurse practitioner uh, in the company, Jessica responded back to me that she hadn't heard from me yet. I said, okay, well, now we hear from me. And I said, congratulations. Um, I said, spammer, uh, I, I am turning your account information uh, to the Department of, uh, of Fraud at, at, uh, at Pathway Financial. I said, Merry Christmas, and your mother never loved you. <laughs> um, to which now Jessica responded, Mama, Mama's prayers keeps me going. So she, the spammer responded to me. And I said, just for, to help you understand, how do you get our information? And she said, now it's Sarah Heath said, for 500 bucks uh, for the update, I can't give you such top notch information for free. These are real people. These are real people that they go to the dark web and they find out how to do this. And somehow they access these email addresses and they just dump thousands of these emails out on, on people um, with the hopes of getting a few bites. And they'll get a thousand bucks here, a thousand bucks there, whatever. Uh, but they're real people. So, uh, you know, of course, I had a little fun and. Um, but the, the point is that th these are real people. So my big point is it only takes once. Guys, it only takes once to get yourself in trouble, to expose the company to trouble. And it really, we need to continue to be diligent. Again, don't feel that you you're by yourself. Get help. Um, your manager, myself, whomever, and we'll help you through it. Okay, let's talk about passwords. Um, okay, so we have to talk about passwords. Yes, we have to talk about passwords. Um, a couple of years ago, we built into our windows that uh, that we need to update our password every 90 days. You should be getting a reminder every 90 days to update your passwords. Um, same for at the domain level, that's entering into the domain. Um, we also get a reminder from Medint that we have to update every 90 days. So just as, as a suggestion works for me is every when I get whichever one I get first, I change my password, then I go change the domain as well. If I get the domain first, I'll change the domain, then I go change MedNet. Med so we're on the same, on the same cycle. 
Usernames are important because that is what we use for audit purposes. We search by username. Um, we never know your password. We don't want to know your password. Um, and certainly when you leave your workstation for any extended period of time, you should sign off of your computer. Of course, passwords do's and don'ts. We don't want you to share it. Don't post it on a sticky. Don't put it on your name tag. Don't write it on the back of your hand. Um, really, you, you need to protect your passwords as best you can. Um, keep them out of sight and, and preferably in a way that a normal person can't find them. And if they do, they don't know what, it, what it's a password for. Okay, let's segue now to talk about breach. You know, this is where you're gonna, we're going to get really, um, I'm going to get in your heads right now if I can. We'll try it. So if you close your eyes for a moment and think about your role in the company and what you do every day and take away the human aspect of it, that there's no humans involved, but the work still happens. The point I'm trying to make with that is that we generate and use millions of data points in what we do on a daily basis. The expectation with those data points that can be attached to an individual is that we have to protect them. And when we fail to protect them, bad things can happen. And when we talk about breach, generally speaking, what we're talking about is those bad things can have an impact completely downstream. And breach can be from one single breach to millions of breaches. And in 2022, November 2022, there was a third-party data breach that impacted 119 pediatric practices. 2.2 million patients were impacted by this breach. It was a software called the Connection Software. We don't use it. We have nothing to do with it. But it just illustrates that why couldn't this happen with Medin someday? Is it something that we did? Maybe. Who knows? Or it could be something that Medin did, and they're not protecting their data. In any case... There, this is such a, and this goes back to the initial slides I showed, that there's so much money involved. And healthcare is even more exposed because not only is it personal financial data and demographic, it's medical information, which then can be packaged and sold as well. Isn't this fun, guys? Quick quiz. Okay. Sending a patient's report to the wrong provider is considered a breach. True. False. Huh. And the answer, of course, is true. Thank you for your answers. Um, the, but just because I got nothing to talk about for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about what a breach is, just to be sure we're on the same page of what a breach is. A breach, by simple definition, is that when you send EPHI or PHI to someone other than to whom the data was intended. Technically, in the rule, it says any any unauthorized acquisition, access use, or disclosure is considered a breach. Once you have a breach, you report the breach to your immediate supervisor, and the immediate supervisor must work with you or the security officer to determine and assess, assess whether the breach was got, had gone to someone you can trust or not trust. Um, so if you discover a breach, you report it, you assess the situation, whether it's EPHI or PHI, it's handled the same way. The reason why you have to do an assessment is determine whether or not you have to notify the victim and the government of the breach. And when it comes to trust, trust is talking about whether or not that information went to a person or persons that have no reason to use it or know what to do with it if it is a breach or not. So, for example, if you took that information, that PHI, that report, and sent it to another doctor's office by mistake, and they know it's not their patient, generally speaking, they'll let you know, hey, that's not our patient. And conversely, sometimes you may have gotten information from an office, not our patient. It really would be more, it would be appropriate for us to let that office know, hey, this isn't our patient we are shredding the document or we're deleting the file. Same scenario, but instead of sending it to a doctor's office, you send it to Walmart. Well, you have no idea at Walmart who's handling that, that piece of information. That would be an untrusted situation. That would be a breach that would require to be 
um, assessed, vic there'd be a victim, and we'd have to notify the federal government that we did that breach. If we do have a breach that is assessed and determined to be one that needs to be uh, followed up on, MHA does have a standard form letter we use. Um, it's kept here on file. The department heads have access to it. And this is the form we would ask the department head to complete that we would send. Basically, it's a, an acknowledgement to the victim of the breach, what to the best of our ability happened, um, and that we'll strive not to do it in the future. What has to happen by February of the following year is we have to go to the official Department of Health and Human Service website and report the breach to the government. And if we have more than 500 breaches, we get our own line in a public government notification. What you're looking at here is the um, eastsidepediatrics.com, which is a pediatric practice just east of Rochester, it's in Fairport, where they had a um, they had a breach for a server issue, and it exposed a thousand seventeen hundred patients' records. And so, they if you go to their website, I don't think I can launch it here. If you were to go to their website, you'll see on the front page of their website is event notification. So they're obliged to post on their website that they had a breach. Not only do you have to notify your patient population you have to notify the government and you have to notify the media. So we ha they have to go to the press in Rochester and say we had a breach. Um, and depending on the situation, they may have to uh, acquire credit, uh, credit checking type of software and pay for it for a period of time for those that were impacted by that breach. And the rest of these are other physician type practices around the area, around the country that have been affected and the reason why. Um, oftentimes it's it's a server issue, sometimes it's an email issue, sometimes it's a lost PC issue. Um, in any case, um, these are very, uh, very specific cases that have to be reported to the government. Okay. I'm going to go down to the next one. There we go. So our next quiz, yep. giving, giving patient results to a person who is not designated on the HIPAA form is a breach. Yeah, and that's why we emphasize, it is true, and the reason that's the reason why we emphasize that you need to get those HIPAA forms accurate. Uh, every time the patient arrives, to be sure that we're, uh, we're doing it correctly, especially in a pediatric office, because as you well know, um, especially when it comes to litigious situations and disharmonious families that... Um, that uh, we can get it, we can get in Dutch if we don't follow the court orders that that have been given to us, uh, and we so uh, when it comes to who can see what data. Chris, I have a question. Yes, question from the audience. So, if we have a newborn baby and mom brings the baby to the appointment for the first time and dad doesn't, and mom signs for just herself, doesn't think to sign for dad, technically we can't give information to the father, correct? Yep. Because if the, if the HIPAA is not correct, um, it's least I would stop and I would inquire to the mom in particular to be sure that uh, it's okay before we release the dad. Because we don't know. You just see a signature on file with no names listed. Right. Okay. Same for the portal as well. Quiz number two, four. There we go. MHA has to report. Every breach to the feds, true or false? True. It's false. Remember, we only have to report to the victim and to the feds after we've assessed whether or not the breach occurred and was sent to someone we can trust or not trust. So the key is, A, recognizing there was a breach. B, getting your, your supervisor involved. Three, doing the assessment. Where did this breach go? Oh, it went to Dr. Smith's office. They called us and they said, we got it by mistake. They destroyed it. Great. You still have to log the breach. We still have to log those breaches. But it does not have to go the, 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 to the extent of notifying the person whose information was breached, nor do we have to uh, inform the, the government. So contingency plan. 
Each loss, breach, or unauthorized access must be assessed for criticality. That's what we just talked about. Um, we have to have contingencies in place if for some reason we have a disaster. And you've all experienced this from time to time where you come into the office first thing in the morning at seven o'clock, you turn on the computer, mm -hmm. you double click on MedEnt and it gives you, a, it gives you a, a message that does not look healthy. As in, I'm not working right now. Um, I'm out to coffee. Whatever it is, MedEnt's down. Um, our disaster has to be able to deal with those situations or maybe your power's out. And in some, some cases, offices are able to operate albeit on a slower pace if they have to go back to paper. In other cases, um, we have to reach out to MedEnt or to add technology and see where the issue is. Um, so at least conceptually, and the good news is we each of the offices has a very good contingency plan in place, and you've all responded very well in those rare events when we have an issue. Um, but all offices, and I know the managers have this, but I published it anyway, should have emergency at MedEnt.com as an email handy on their on their walkie talkies, um, because that is the email address that we would reach out to in the event MedEnt is not available first thing in the morning or if we have a major a major catastrophe. Um, it should only be used in emergency situations. And if you do have an emergency meltdown some morning, that's who you email first, even before you contact me or you contact that technology, you reach out to emergency at medent.com. Other pH stuff. This is common sense stuff. Patients and visitors. We should always escort our patients or es escort our visitors through the office. They should not be allowed to wander aimlessly through your office. Maintenance, maintenance documentation. If, if we fix or update or replace equipment, we must make sure the PHI is accounted for, even if it's your copy machine. Copy machines have memory, and sometimes those memories can, 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 can contain private information about our patients. If we get rid of a copy machine, we have to make sure we get a certification that the machine has been scrubbed. Is your email encrypted? If it's from MHA to MHA in the family, the answer is yes. So if Dawn is emailing Jessica Sherwood, she can send PHI because our email is all encrypted. If Suburban is emailing Western New York Peds, encrypted. If Maine Peds, is emailing MHA, encrypted. We are all in the same domain in the same family as long as you're using your at location email address. However, if you're within the email uh, MHA family to anyone on the outside, Gmail, Yahoo, Verizon, Roadrunner, whoever, it is not encrypted. And why that's important is because we never send email that's unencrypted that contains PHI. So what do we do when we need to send e e PHI secure? Well, here's your next quiz. Boom. Do we sprinkle fairy dust on your computer? Do we ask your manager to send it for you? The answer to that is no. <laughs> or do you type secure in the subject line? So the answer is three you type secure in the subject line. So very simply, if, if Chris Terabonsi wants to send an email to a Gmail account that contains an attachment of EPHI, I type the word secure, uppercase secure, anywhere in the subject line. And what that does is that encrypts the email so that when the person on the other side receives it, they have to log in to a product called Barracuda and it, they have to log in, and it, by them doing that, it will enable the email, which was encrypted, to be unencrypted. And the good news is if they respond to you with another attachment, it will also be encrypted back to you. So this was a product of the, of the upgrade we did before that enables, enables us to send EPHI to a non-MHA family member. So one of the homework assignments I'm going to ask each of you is to go to your desktop, go to your laptop, go to your tablet, and look at your PC documents. And the question is, in all the, in all the file folders that are there, is there any EPHI on that device? If the answer is yes, 
then we're vulnerable. That is a vulnerability because this laptop could easily walk out of the office with PHI on it, and we're, we are at risk. So there really should not be ePHI kept on our desktops. All the data that we use in MHA or in your office is kept in one of two places. It's either in the MedEnt server or it's in the secure MHA server. That's really the only places that ePHI data should be kept. Now, if you have your favorite recipe for spaghetti sauce on your document, okay, that's a little different. But I'm talking about specifically PHI. Okay, and the nevers. We never email ePHI that's unencrypted. You can fax it. Faxes are still secure. But your emails to outside of the domain are not. You should never text ePHI. Uh, we should never store it on your mobile device or your smartphone or your USB or those little memory sticks. Those USB little memory sticks are not secure. And finally, yay, we're finally. Make sure you're going to be getting an attestation um, from your department head. Um, and if you don't have it, Don will get it to you. Uh, that we're going to ask you to sign um, that you attended this beautiful session, that you had a wonderful time. You'll tell your family and friends about it, and um, you'll complete the mission of being better understood. Lastly, do we have any questions? If you do, update up. Uh, let your department head know. Feel free to email me directly. I'll do my best to answer them right away. I really appreciate what you guys do and the time you spend listening to yours truly and understanding and appreciating that this is in our best interest uh, to pay attention to. So with that, I sign off, and I hope you have a great day. And, Don, how do I say goodbye? Up here? Hang up. I'm hanging up now. Ciao.